I uh, hope you all had a good lunch and are trying to fight the food coma because I'm going to do a quick whirlwind tour through everything we've done in the pipeline over the past year. Um, I lead the stream processing effort uh, in the real-time data infrastructure team at Netflix. Um, many decisions, business and both product, um, are based on insights that we gather from the data we collect at Netflix across all these different uh, verticals, including content, product, you know, talent, infrastructure, the whole gamut. Uh, we started about a year ago um, to take over this old legacy system uh, that we inherited. And this legacy system started very simple. All the need was to get all these data, the events that were just starting to flow through our system. And um, they used an old project called Chakwa. Many of you may have heard of it or may not have heard of it. Um, and over time, this evolved, and evolved into a big hairball. There were a lot of redundant data paths um, to get the same data over across many links and, and, and sinks. And uh, this presented uh, its own challenges. Every redundant pathway had its own set of unique failures, and it became uh, very soon a nightmare to maintain and manage the system. So this is something we inherited a year ago, uh, and we set out to replace this with a brand new system. Uh, so that we could support at least one's processing semantics, we could scale, we could make it multi-tenant, and uh, enable stream processing as a service, which I'll mention and talk about towards the end of this uh, talk. And we also wanted to uh, eclipse the dormant um, Chukwa open source project that was heavily being used. Uh, so our goal was to migrate this large pipeline, uh, transferring over one petabyte of event data every day in flight without any service disruption. And the leave we were offered was not to lose more than 0.1% of the data while we did this. Uh, so it was a huge challenge not only to switch teams, uh, sorry, switch traffic in real time, but also guaranteeing that the data integrity stays uh, put. So early this year, uh, we launched uh, the new pipeline. Uh, looks like this. We simplified a lot, a lot of aspects of it. Sorry, the clicker is stuck. Interesting. So this was just two weeks after Netflix announced its global launch in 2016. Uh, we launched to over 130 countries, and it became a truly internet uh, global TV provider. And this means a lot of metrics, and a lot of data uh, that's what was flowing through our system. Sorry for the glitches, but there we go. Um, let's just take a second to look at these numbers. It's over 14,000 years worth of video that's being watched on Netflix every day. It's not minutes, it's not, it's not hours, it's actually years. And so this leads to um, over 700 billion events that flow through our system. And uh, we hit a trillion uh, in December. And right now we process over a trillion events every day accounting for all the fan outs that happen uh, towards the end. Uh, we peak at 11 million events. Uh, the average size ranges anywhere from a few hundred megabytes all the way to 10 megabytes. And uh, we process over 1.3 petabytes a day. So that was 2.6 petabytes when we had two pipelines running and when we switched over. Uh, we still achieve four nines, more than four nines right now, uh, availability of the service. So if you want to know more about the evolution of the pipeline, we have a blog post out there that you can take a look at. Uh, so let's look at how the data actually flows through the system. The event producers uh, produce the data. They hit are what's called the fronting Kafka clusters. Um, they go through a SAMSA router, and it ends up either, all our events actually end up in S3, and optionally they end up in Elasticsearch or Consumer Kafka, depending on what the use case is. Uh, the reason we split up our Kafka clusters is to better deal with availability, and I'll go into a little more detail soon. Uh, producing events, uh, all our event payload is immutable. We don't touch the payload that the user gives us. Um, however, we do have our custom metadata that we inject because we have our own binary wire protocol. Uh, these fields are really useful um, in terms of doing analysis as well as trying to trace where they came from. Uh, and our custom wire protocol is pretty efficient. Uh, we currently support JSON, Avro's on the way, we're gonna support protobuf, 
And what this allows us to do is allows us to add additional metadata for traceability uh, or other metrics that we want to want it to flow through it. And also allows us to support different formats and make it both backwards and forwards compatible so that it's easy to upgrade our systems transparently uh, without the users knowing about it. And it's very efficient, it's only 10 bytes overhead per message considering our message sizes are pretty large. We wrapped our own Kafka producer on top of the existing producer uh, so that we can uh, make it uh, more resilient and not have the application that's having a library actually fail in term whenever there's an outage, right? Uh, our number one priority is to serve videos flawlessly. And if that means we lose, lose a few data uh, points that we can analyze over, you know, that's fine, but we don't want the experience to suffer. Uh, so we do best effort delivery and we act equals one. And uh, we do dynamic buffer size tuning on the producer so that we can minimize the loss. And as you saw, we don't lose uh, much of the data at all. You know, we have 4.9 availability in the amount of data we can put through the system. Uh, so we have two major fronting, uh, two major classes of clusters. One is the fronting cluster and the other one is the consumer Kafka clusters. Uh, we have a lot of data coming in and we want to make sure we don't lose this data. If we allowed every consumer app to connect to fronting Kafka clusters, then we would have uh, a situation where it could get overloaded very easily and that would result in a lot of data loss. So we separated it out. What we do is wherever we have the fan out and we have a lot of consumer Kafka clusters, we route those events to a different consumer Kafka cluster. And the only component that's allowed to talk to the fronting Kafka cluster is our infrastructure. So we can control and we know uh, what scale it's, it's gonna be uh, hitting the Kafka clusters with. So that way we have kind of a good isolation between fronting Kafka and the consumer Kafka clusters. Uh, we started with 07, we are already moved to 09 and we're moving to VPC. Uh, we paid a lot of pioneer tax in doing that in the cloud because it hadn't been done in the cloud at the scale we run it at. Uh, we do a lot of open source contributions back either while working with Confluent or ourselves, like the rack cover assignment was from our team. Uh, and uh, the other important aspect is we actually enable unclean leader elections uh, because we care more about availability. Uh, that does brings its own challenges of managing the cluster, um, but it gives us better av availability. Uh, so we run over 4,000 uh, Kafka broker nodes currently, and the way we have split them up is we have eight clusters in each region, and we, have, we are spread across three regions, so there are about 24 clusters. And for each cluster, that's 24 clusters, so we have 24 Zookeeper clusters as well. Uh, when we tried to launch the service last year, we had a big uh, meltdown that on day one. It was a weird combination of an edge case in Zookeeper, in Kafka, and network issues. Um, it's something that only happens in once in a 10,000 chance, but it happened on day one when we launched it. So that's where we moved and split to uh, individual Zookeeper clusters so that we have true isolation across clusters. Um, so a few quick tips, um, try and stay under 10,000 partitions per cluster and under 200 nodes. And you may want to leave at least 40% disk space for the replication um, traffic that it needs to uh, happen on each broker. Uh, so taking the whole availability and, and failure to the next level, we built um, Kafka Kong. So we actually every week route production traffic from one cluster to the backup cluster to make sure that when there is a real issue and a cluster is not responding, we don't lose our data, we just sw switch over to a backup cluster that we build in real time. Uh, we have the backup cluster size to only three nodes, so it dynamically scales up. Uh, the reason for three nodes is it lets us quickly create the topics while the other nodes are warming up and coming up and we can start taking traffic. Uh, so this happens at least once a week. It's part of the on-call. When we go on-call, the on-call person just does this. And it's really simple, we go into our tool, uh, we pick the cluster in the region we want to fail over, and we just hit a button, and it just happens. So we have a prep failover button here. What that lets us do is, um, if there's a real scenario and the automation's not taking care of the drops, uh, then you could proactively go and prep a failover cluster, and if there's a need, we fail it over, otherwise we try and recover the original cluster. Uh, we also have an auditor process that runs out of band. It runs in its own cluster. 
Um, and the benefit of this is it lets us monitor um, interesting metrics um, and uh, report on it. The reason of not having this in the broker process itself is if there's network partitioning or any other issues that's not visible from outside, this helps us uh, make that happen. And we can do things like you know, performance monitoring and testing. Uh, we have a metadata visualization tool that will open source soon that lets us look at the health of uh, Kafka clusters and also search topics across all these clusters. Uh, we just published a tech blog as well. You can go and read more about this uh, if you're interested. Uh, now it's the routing service. The routing service is interesting. We chose SAMSA because uh, of the performance, the resource utilization, and the back pressure mm -hmm. support it had compared to uh, Spark 1.2 that um, I looked into last year. Um, our routing infrastructure is built on top of Docker, SAMSA, MySQL, uh, a little bit of Go and C, uh, and we use Kafka itself for the checkpointing cluster. So we use the offsets that are read on the consumer side. Those get automatically stored in, in the checkpoint cluster. And this is a built-in feature of SAMSA, but we had to tweak a few things about it. Uh, so on the high level, we have uh, on the control plane a router job manager that decides which Docker container uh, runs uh, on which machine, what it's going to, which topic it's going to read from, what partitions it's going to read from and what kind of filtering or projection uh, or transformation it's going to do. So this is more uh, a pipeline as a service that runs within Netflix, uh, and we set this end-to-end -end stream flow for our customers. And once the data is in um, RDS about every job uh, and the environment it needs to run in, uh, we have a small executor process that runs on actual physical hosts, and it in a, in a one-minute reconciliation loop, checks what's in the RDS database, sees the Docker containers that need to run on the host, and runs those containers. Uh, it only uses Zookeeper one time only when it comes up or when a uh, uh, physical host actually goes down. Um, and that time it's used to assign an ID, which is used to map to the jobs that it needs to run on. Uh, so what we did is we uh, run multiple SAMSA jobs for one Kafka topic that we are reading from. Uh, and we run SAMSA in a standalone mode. SAMSA has a job manager and, and a task manager and a containers, but we don't use the higher level. We directly control, control each of the tasks, and we run it in, in um, a standalone mode. And we run every job that runs processes messages only for one sync for isolation. If one sync is down, if you were to process multiple messages, and because SAMSA is single-threaded, you'd be impacted, so we run one uh, job that writes data to only one sync. And we have one checkpointing topic uh, per Kafka cluster. Now this is really important because if you have one checkpointing cluster, too many checkpointing topics for the same source topic you're reading from, now when you want to upgrade or do something else, you have to worry about moving your state, or if you change the partition assignment for the containers that they're running on, uh, then it makes it harder. So this way, if you have one checkpoint topic, all the metadata about which partitions and how much progress you've made in the consumer side is in one place, and you can dynamically scale the number of uh, routing containers. So that's what we do. If a topic gets more traffic, less traffic, we can shrink up and down the number of containers we use, and this lets it, uh, makes it happen. All our jobs, once they start, the configuration is not mutable. It's immutable, so we don't ever have to worry about it going wrong or some dynamic property change or changing things around and failing. It's one less thing we have to worry about. Um, so this is the executor I was talking about. Um, it also logs snapshots of uh, a log that's running on the containers, and it routinely uploads it to S3. And it also makes it available streaming. So we have client tools available locally on our machine. It's just a simple command line that you can log into any of these containers, or you can stream the logs. You can specify you want to uh, logs from a certain period of time, so it'll fetch from S3 if it's historical, it'll stream, it'll seamlessly stitch all these logs and give it to you. So it gives us a very nice tooling to look at what's happening in, on, on our clusters. Um, so yes, there's no mesas running, it's simple RDS and a reconciliation loop on, on the node. And this is great for us because uh, less moving pieces, right? Uh, so we made a bunch of um, changes to SAMSA to make all this happen. Uh, we use the thread job factory in production, which is advised against in, in, in their docs, but it works fine. Um, 
uh, I implemented a, a fix for static partition assignment, so you can, we can run it in standalone mode. And uh, we added both a regex and a range partitioner specification there. The other big problem running this at scale was um, SAMHSA allows you to specify a prefetch buffer with a count in it. The problem with counts is you never know how much memory it's going to use because of the variable message size. So you put in a patch where you can cap the amount of memory it uses for uh, prefetching, and it dynamically manages that memory. Uh, so this, these patches have been adopted into O10, and the SAMHSA team uh, ported it over to O10. Uh, so it performs really well. It stays within 10 to 15 percent of what you specified because you know at the end of the day you're running on the JVM and you don't know how much extra overhead it's going, it's going to add. Uh, but practically, we've seen it go no more than 10 to 15 percent. And the overhead of adding that was only 0.02 percent. So we backported a few more configuration patches as well, so that when we launch Docker containers, we can specify and override environment variables to achieve the immutability of configs. Once the container starts uh, and the SAMHSA job starts, the config don't change. But we, have, we need a way to override it, so we do it at the environment layer. So we run 14,000 plus Docker containers today to run the service, and they run on over 1,400 uh, nodes uh, across three regions. And we don't do any cross-region replication on our Kafka clusters. Uh, it's all island mode right now but we can route data from one cluster to the other using the routing infrastructure where needed. Uh, so I gave a talk last year at SAMHSA Meetup. If you want all the gory details of what went in, you, you can take a look at this link later. It'll be posted. Uh, so we measure metrics at all these data points that we have, and we have a dashboard that's customer facing, and what happens is anytime a new event is sent on a new topic that's been provisioned, it automatically shows up here in the dashboard. Uh, we don't have to manually enter it. It'll automatically show up. All the routings will show up. Uh, and the users can use it in a self-serve mode. And we have a dev-facing one um, as well so that we can look at our internal metrics that the users don't have to look at. So we've scaled to you know, 1 million, 1 trillion plus uh, a day in an what? So what we did is we exposed the cost to our users and the larger topics producers. And what they found is one team found they were producing more than they actually need to. They did some basic enhancements, and they cut it down by 600%. So we saved cost overall uh, really fast in, in the span of two weeks. So cost attribution was a, was a big deal as well. And we do a lot of automation to free up our resources so that we can actually build infrastructure. Um, so everything you saw today is we build it and we run it. Uh, we move to a, a, a more no ops model uh, than a DevOps model. Uh, so we don't have any project managers, we don't have any product managers, we talk to the customers, we are an infrastructure team so it's unique. Um, and we help drive the uh, direction of it where it's, it needs to go and the operations and end-to-end. And, 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 and -end. So it doesn't mean we are, we are overworked all the time. We just make simple and better choices. Uh, and we lean towards self-healing systems. So what are we doing in the future? Uh, we're building systems so that we can improve the quality of the data, uh, whether it be in a schema registry, discovery, and, and, and self-service tooling. So stream processing as a service is a, is a big um, initiative that we are looking at. We have different stream processing systems at Netflix. And we want to make it easy for the user to uh, work on this. So what we are doing is we are using, we're going to use Apache Beam as our abstraction layer. And we're going to have runners for different systems so that we can target and help the user write to one API. And behind the scenes, we can run it on different systems based on their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so this is how it's going to look like. You know, the user comes in, creates a Beam API. We dockerize it for them. We get it submitted. They automatically get a dashboard and we get it up and running. Um, and they have an option of submitting a JAR or a DSL, and uh, we take it from there. So right now we're working on um, Apache Beam and Flink is the next revision of our pipeline and the SPAS offering. Uh, and as we find more insight into this and scale this, we'll share our findings. So if you still need more data, we have a bunch of links listed here. Um, there's a lot of material out there, so feel free to uh, read through or ping me or if you have any questions.
Thank you. I think we're out of time. Yeah, sorry we lost a couple of minutes in the presentation. So.